we always talk about how training for, for long course racing, whether it's 70.3 or fulls, is it's about energy expenditure and how you can manage that and prepare your body to become really durable on these race days and that it's never about how fast you go, it's about how little you slow down. And a course like this that starts with no break, there is no break. Because you start off with a very long open water swim. Yes, it's got a wetsuit, but as you guys saw on, on Sunday, a fair to just tough swim. You're on it from out of the gate. The amount of energy and even mental expenditure, not just the physical part, from a tough swim like that, and then starting the day to you know you now you've got a really difficult bike ride, it takes its toll on people. <laughs> What's up, buddy? Welcome, welcome, welcome. And just like that, we're back in different states and different cities. Yep. <laughs> and just like that, I'm back in Chattanooga. Just arrived back uh, about 30 minutes ago. Mike, I think you're still in Wisconsin. I am. I'm yeah, in Beloit, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Beloit. And uh, welcome, Crushing Iron Podcast. I definitely know the episode. This is episode... 301 300 our 301st podcast uh we had a great time this last weekend uh this is a triathlon related podcast where we cover everything triathlon training life how they intersect and uh, mike and i do our best to share our experiences as uh, both coaches and athletes the things we've gone through and witnessed and experienced over the last uh, 10 or 15 years so we do our best to include that within the podcast and to hopefully deliver it in a way that's uh, easily digestible so you can apply that to your regular life and uh, we've been coming to you twice a week for about three years we'll continue to do so and this last week we were in madison wisconsin for episode 300 a wonderful time a great episode thanks to jessica jacobs who was our guest caster and also just being surrounded by more more good people than I can than I could have originally ever fathomed. So outstanding weekend, a great day, and a great weekend in Madison. Couldn't have said it better, man. Uh, it's actually heating up here now that you left. Oh yeah, well you know that's, uh, that's kind of how I roll. <laughs> it was a little chilly out there. Not chilly. It was actually perfect race conditions, other than a little bit of wind on the swim. I felt like, and uh, I agree, man. It was just uh, we, you know, we set out about I don't know would be 10 months before making Wisconsin our A race, our team race, I should say, and invited a lot of our athletes and friends of the podcast and everybody in the close Facebook group to come on up and, you know, celebrate, and everybody showed, man. It was an unbelievable flow of just cool people and solid people. That's the way I would say it, you know up and down the block we had the podcast and then we had the team dinner and at the hotel and it was just loaded with friendly faces i i'm just a little bit taken aback by all that every time it happens yeah you're a little i don't know you're a little bit more emotional than you uh in your in your you know in podcast 300 you basically said you didn't do any reflecting but yet <laughs> this morning via if you exchange texts I, th- I think it sounds like you're doing a little bit more reflecting than you usually do Bro, man, that's that's our private conversation there. <laughs> oh, come on. None of, our, none of our conversations are private. <laughs> <laughs> you're right about that. You can't. Uh, uh, no, you're right. I, I mean, I, I think when I answered that question, I, was, I meant immediately after the race. I don't reflect. I yeah. just kind of try to soak it in. But, uh, um, you know, that day yesterday and then, of course, today, I've been kind of just thinking about it and how grateful I feel to be able to do that. Um, I think I'm just going to start off with saying that I, again, hope that I would probably do better. And I think most of us have that, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of times. But I've sort of reconciled that with the fact that it was basically the same time I had at Ironman Wisconsin six years ago. And, you know, I'm getting older, you know, so that's got to be, that's got to stand for something. You know, holding yeah. pace for seven, you know, seven straight Ironman races, basically. And that's about what I've done, you know. So um, there's something there to be proud of, I think. And I feel good about that, you know. But in in a lot of ways, it's sort of, and that's what this sport's about, but it's sort of back to the whiteboard. It is, man. (laughs) It's, listen, it's, uh, I was trying to think of a way I rode rode back from, uh, from Madison to Nashville yesterday with another one of our athletes, Tommy. And 
we were just kind of talking back and forth about the race and and just kind of getting feedback and you know and then my wheels are already like turning like i think i think after races i'm always i mean on the on the emotional mental side like i'm always very appreciative like anytime you can experience and witness working especially when you work remotely like i do with like 95 percent of the athletes that i work with are remote and we live in the same state and while we get together at camps and other events and other races you know it's not like i see him every single day you know i know many coaches don't have that uh you know, opportunity or in that environment, but it's always wonderful to kind of get to spend time at the race venue with the athletes, especially when there's such a large group of them uh, in a city that I'm already fairly familiar with and just get to experience the whole day and watch them as, you know, as, as long as they all cross the finish line, then I'm already happy, you know, because completing one and finishing one is already an accomplishment in and of itself. I mean, making it to the venue is another huge accomplishment. And making it through the training, making it through, you know, avoiding injuries or, or, you know, making smart decisions when you are injured and getting to the start line and just making it is such a huge accomplishment because, you know, there are so many other obstacles in life, physical, emotional, life stressors you know, um, that, you know, circumstances that can prevent you from doing that. And then usually, like, as, as I think Jason Kenner was joking with me, he was like, so right now, like when when all the athletes get out of the swim, I'm already I'm like I'm already pretty good pretty good off because I'm fairly confident they're all going to have pretty good out of swims and get off of it and get out of the swim. But on the bike, Jason Kinner referred to me as being on DEFCON five in terms of alert status. He was like, "You are because to- it is it's stressful as a coach to have all your athletes on course, not knowing." You know, it's and it's not like a it, my worry and stress when when you guys are out there racing has nothing to do with performance. It's all about are you guys going to get off the bike safe? You know, avoiding wrecks, avoiding mechanicals, all the things that are you know more important. The results take care of themselves. So once everybody gets off the bike, I can kind of breathe easy because I know you're going to finish. And so that like wipes away a little bit of the of the worry in terms of um, you know I guess kind of being in dad mode, but. But watching everybody perform is great, and then so I can say like when I leave these weekends, I leave very, you know, satiated. I'm, I'm full, but yet never really totally satisfied because I'm already thinking of like ways to tweak things or things like maybe can do better as a coach. And looking back and like giving like you know instant, uh, not instant feedback, but kind of my instant analysis on how things went without even like looking at numbers. You know, I, I see just areas improvement on my end as a coach like things i could maybe tweak and do better but i think that's just coaches athletes you know you've already done it like you said going back to the whiteboard that's also just what makes the sport so awesome is that you can't really ever have it figured all out because every day every course every year on a course is 100 percent totally different and you're never going to be dealt the same cards and so you gotta it is it's just it's a, it's an ongoing puzzle and even when you finally get, even if you have that like one perfect day where you put everything together and the conditions are right and you just, you express your full fitness that day and everything falls into place. Well, then after that, you're just left chasing that day again. You know, like, how am I, how can I get that day back? You know, and so it is, it's a, it's a very um, cerebral sport in terms of the amount of time you can spend analyzing and, and, um, going back through feedback and training and, and how just to tweak things to get better. And, and you've got nutrition, recovery, taper, long rides, long. I mean, there's so many things to like dissect. It's really is. It's, it's a never ending. It's a never ending process with, with no expiration and no dead end. Yep. It's uh, interesting to hear you talk about that DEFCON 4. Or whatever. Is it DEFCON 4? I've never really That was DEFCON. I, I don't know what the DEFCON is. Five, Con's the about. levels. Yeah, but yeah, let's we'll just say five. Let's, oh, say, let's five. say five. five. Yeah. Because this was really, uh, I had a little taste of it in Chattanooga, but you know, we started the club program this year, and uh, we had, between the clubs and people I'm actively coaching, like nine people racing at Wisconsin. So I had a little bit of that going on in my head, too, because... Um, you know that that swim was, uh, <laughs> as we will probably get into here now, uh, because I've acknowledged it. Uh, it was it was windy that morning, and the and the water was a little rough. And as a athlete and coach, now that kind of thing got in my head a little bit because you're out there and you're like, man, this is really tough. And and you know I've been through it many times, but a lot of these people hadn't. And 
so that kind of creeps into my head and then certainly that bike course is it's uh it's awesome i mean i have nothing bad to say about that bike course whatsoever i feel like yeah the roads are a little rough in the beginning but for the most part on the loop i thought they were pretty good shape Mm -hmm. and it's super fun and it's very hard and there's some very fast sections and i as a background in biking i i feel comfortable out there i like the speed and i like all that stuff but i realize that it can be daunting to some people i'm sure Mm -hmm. because especially i think at one point i don't know if it started raining on the bike at all out there but there was that sort of like threat of rain and then and it was a little chilly and just the being out there can be a little intimidating and so while I didn't run across a lot of athletes on the bike, I started seeing them on the run, and that was, you know, I felt like that sense of relief that you're talking about. Um, it was just good to see that everybody made it through, and, and it's, a, it's a real real thing, you know. Um, it's hard to stay engaged if you're racing like that. I mean, I think it's hard enough to stay engaged in general, you know, when you're racing and you're not thinking of anyone else but yourself. And then, like, can you add other people or, or even just friends, you know, other teammates, like, hey, I haven't seen so-and-so. You know, and you thought you might, you thought like you might get out of the water, um, you know, after them uh, or before them, and you're on the bike or sick, and you're going to either chase them and catch up, or they're going to catch up to you, and you never see them. Your your mind kind of plays like, I wonder where they are. I wonder if they're okay. Um, and obviously, I don't think everyone always thinks that because some people are totally dialed in. But anytime you think you have friends and or teammates or athletes that you coach or even your coaches on course, I think I think it's natural. And again, it just it adds an additional layer of weight on to the emotional and mental focus that you have to have over such a long course of the day and it, and it can either be distracting or energizing depending on you know how you're using it and how you're channeling that that those thoughts and feelings and in your focus but yeah i mean you said it and, and you and i were both at the uh, awards uh, banquet yesterday morning we had some athletes getting awards and and you uh, graciously picked up our tri club uh third place uh award but both of the pros, I thought, I found it because it's 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 one thing to watch on land, you know, from the vantage you know vantage point about how how you think a swim is going to go and based on how rough it is, and that's one thing to hear from a couple of age groupers because you know we all tend to be a little dramatic, you know, when it comes to oh, for sure. <laughs> our own events. Everything is a headwind and everything. Um, everything was like the roughest swim, the hardest bike, the worst conditions I've ever. The DNF rate for the event was actually 78%. Uh, nobody made it except for like seven of us. So we always tend to like, you know, air towards the side of over dramatizing everything. Yep. Um, and like, <laughs> like a, a short, funny little quip about before we get back to the swim is I've had a bunch of athletes that were spectating and they were like sending me texts at like after mile 20. And they're like, hey, hey, so-and-so's hurting bad. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's like mile 20 of the marathon. What do you like? What do you honestly think they're going to be feeling right now? Anything <laughs> fun? No. They're going to be in excruciating pain, and it's going to be terrible. So don't send me texts saying they're hurting because, uh, yeah, they should be. It's an Iron Man. So let's not, let's not over-dramatize the situation here. But – both of the pros, but so they interviewed both the or they asked the two professional winners, the male and the female, who won Ironman Wisconsin to kind of you know give a little spiel, and they both mentioned how tough the swim was, um, which that to me that's a little better indicator of how difficult the conditions actually were. And I kind of had an idea because a couple of the swimmers that are usually in the one hour range were about six to seven minutes back, so you know at most people I saw that it was about a six to eight minute difference, and when I and kind of originally anticipated for a lot of athletes on how much slower it was the the swim was tough um it was windy it was it was um it was very it didn't look nearly as bad on land until you got close and then you can kind of see the tide and the in the not so much the current but it was it was a it had like a washing machine effect uh that close to the that close to shore and then when you add in you know 2500 people going in a circle you know, it's the motion of the ocean, baby. But it was not, it was a difficult swim, and I think that really set the tone, good, bad, or indifferent, for a lot of athletes when they exited the water um, on what kind of day that they needed to be prepared to have. Yeah, man. I I don't. I went down and looked at the course, and yeah, I sent you those pictures, and I kind of thought I had a you know plan for it. 
and uh, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face, right? And like you say all the time, and I got in the, the tr- it was tricky because normally it's a rectangle, more or less, it, from what I'm used to. And this year, of course, was, I think it was this way last year too, but they, they angle it out from the shore. So the first buoy line isn't really straight. It kind of angles away from the shoreline. And frankly, it was didn't feel that hard to swim out that way. But I was having a difficult time with the sighting just because my tendency is to drift a little right. And so I was kind of dragging off to the side. And so on the way out, it was a little tough for me to sight and stay on the... Because also the buoys were a little bit... They weren't really in line a lot of times, it felt like. And then maybe that was just because the, you know, the waves are pushing them around. So it's, and I was telling people, man, it was like sometimes I'd go up to sight and I'd see the buoy. And then about two or three strokes later, I'd look up to sight again. And it would be totally about 10 feet to my right or something weird. And mm-hmm. I kept, I, at the time, you know, of course, it was frustrating. But upon reflection, it's sort of this, I guess, you know, it was just maybe spinning my body or, you know, whatever was happening. That, that So that, to me... I felt really strong out there. It's just that I couldn't, I couldn't nail my lines, you know, and that's that's all part of it, you know. I I thought I had swimmed uh, enough and practiced enough, but you, it's tough to practice that, and uh, you know, a lot for a lot of people, depending on where they live and those kind of conditions. And for whatever reason, I just couldn't find the pocket, and well, it happens, right? And I ended up, uh, I got a good, I guess, dose of green algae for the day. Uh, swallow a little bit of water. <laughs> I mean, it was, mm-hmm. it was, you you weren't the only one. There was quite a few people that I think. <laughs> Maybe that's why through. I feel so good. You get that algae in you. Man. I'm telling you, I think there's quite a few people who started their uh, hydration plan a little bit early on the swim. <laughs> yeah, and I knew it was. It I did, it was it did get my stomach a little bit. I never really have stomach problems, but I had some on the bike a little bit, and maybe that was why. Um, who knows? Yeah, it was, uh, listen, it made for the day while the temperature, listen, every, I think that's the thing that I think oftentimes we, we forget, and, and I oftentimes forget this as a coach as well, is like every change in the environment and the atmosphere and the temperature and the wind and whatever brings about its own positives and negatives. You know, like there, there really is no such thing really as perfect conditions because even the greatest of conditions or the worst of conditions still open yourself up to make mistakes within them. And I think a lot of times we, we take the, we take, um, the course, you know, like take a flat course or a quote unquote easy course, you know, like it may be something that's easy also creates its own challenges. And they often revolve around how we mentally, emotionally prepare to execute an approach that day. And we don't overlook things or assume they aren't going to be difficult. You know, this swim isn't going to be challenging. and I'm not going to have a panic attack or anxiety attack because in the water because it's downstream. You know, and so then you see people taking the other end of the spectrum. Thinking, I don't have to swim as much. It's going to be an easy swim. And then they end up having a really bad swim. And as we all know, you know, this you might not be able to win it in the swim, but you can lose it. And that sets up your whole day, you know. Or you've got a bike course and it's super flat, and so you're like, ah, I don't, you know, really have to do much, uh, you know, hill climbing, and or you know, it's just an easy point. And then you find yourself like really uh, struggling because you can't stay aero for long periods of time, right? You know, so, so it's the same thing with courses. Then you take temperatures into effect, like you take really hot days. And you're over, like you're kind of like overhyped to stay on your nutrition and your fueling and your hydration. And you're like, well, you know, it's cooler out, so I don't have to drink as much. You know, or uh, I was talking to a, a, on the phone with another one of our athletes yesterday on the way home, and she was saying that, you know, like the colder it gets, and a lot of athletes mentioned this to me, and I think, and I'm not sure, I'm, I haven't talked to you about it yet, but a lot of athletes expressed how much they were having to pee oh. all day long. And so you think that you're hydrated, right? Because you're peeing up. But the the physiological aspect of it is actually that the colder it gets, your kidneys are like trying to help flush the water out of your body because it's it's trying to operate under the um, circumstance of trying to keep your body warm. So getting that fluid out that keeps you cool, it's trying to expel that as quickly as possible. So you're thinking, oh, okay, hey, I'm cool. Like, you know, I'm 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 perfectly hydrated. Yet you're having to pee a ton, um, and so that all, that also plays mind tricks on you. And then it's not as hot, it's not as humid, so you might forget to drink or take. Like I don't need to take it as much. I'm not gonna be sweating as much, and then it all all of a sudden catches up to you. And 
you find yourself behind the eight ball on nutrition because you just you just didn't think you needed enough. So again, like every single race day and every environment and, and weather conditions, they all demand something different. And they, all, and they all still demand attention to detail, preparation, and execution just on the nutrition and fueling part. And the same can be said, obviously, for executing the race like you want to on the from a physical standpoint. But they, again, like there, there's no there's no easy day. There's just isn't, you know. And I think oftentimes we we get caught up in a, athletes like to do this, you know, because as long as they haven't done it, it's an easy race. Oh, that's such an easy race. It swims downstream, that runs flat. You know, it's so much easier. This one is the epic race. Like this one is like you, you got to put the letter on your back. Like you know, you did Tahoe 2014. Like it was the hardest race ever, and no one's ever gonna, you know. And so we always think that again, and like we always kind of over dramatize it, but. The, the truth of the matter is, is, and I've said this before, is that the hardest race you're ever going to do is the one you're training for now because you haven't done it. You don't know what it's going to bring. The training is different. Your life is different. The course will be different. Even if you've done the same course 10 years in a row, they've never been the exact same, and you've never been the exact same athlete. So it's always different, and there are hard situations for every day. And I, I would honestly like to like going back towards because I saw someone else kind of comment on the inabilities of a lot of the athletes at World Championship seventy point three in Nice because it's it was a very technical bike ride. It was one huge uphill one way, and then like Tour de France descents going back the other way. And I saw a lot of people commenting and, and making remarks about how you could tell. I mean, obviously, you couldn't probably you know immediately tell, but how obvious it was in a lot of circumstances the athletes that only ride inside and only ride on their trainers. They were they were on their brakes. They couldn't take any corners. They didn't know how to take turns, and they were super skittish and just absolutely purging time because they weren't prepared. You know, they just they they're on swift and they're inside and they're not they're not presented with the elements. And I have to think the same thing is true with courses like Wisconsin, where and we, again I'm not going to go over this in like uh, in nauseam again like I've done before and we've mentioned in previous podcasts. But like the bike course is as fair as you're going to find, and that's really the best way I can put it. It's just fair. It, it it's a great equalizer of courses to where you have to be able to withstand not the greatest road surfaces. You got to be able to stay aero. You got to be able to climb. You know how to, you need to know how to do both. You need to know how to shift your gears appropriately. You need to know how to uh, shift gears before it's time to. You need to be able. You need to know how to corner. You need to know how to descend. You need to know how to pace yourself. You need to know not how you know not to get out of your saddle when you climb. Like it's a, just a very very well rounded course. And like you said, like it's one of your favorites, or you know slash most I think probably it's like most engaging courses. In terms of, yes, it's difficult, and yes, you're likely on it for a longer period than you would be on other courses, but it's engaging because there's always multiple decisions to make versus like a course like Texas where, you know, I think we were like watching footage of Starkey on the bike course, and it looked like he didn't even like look up for like minutes at a time. You know, he yeah, was just like no head, head down, head, head down in arrow, just looking like four feet in front of you versus Wisconsin, where you basically have to be aware of what the next 40 meters in front of you are going to look like and then uh, judge and make things that, you know, you need to adjust to and prepare for. So, I, again, I think it's um, – that's why I think the course is so – again, fun is a relative term. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I think that's, for sure. that's why the course is so engaging, you know? Mm-hmm. And while we're on it, I, I just we were at the awards thing and and we did hear the I guess the winner was uh, was it Munoz? Is that the guy who no, won it? Definitely not Munoz. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we I think we're butchered. He was definitely I think maybe from Europe over there, but he was. Uh, um, I'm he re- it says E A Munoz or something. M- oh, that's okay. Anyway, yeah, yeah. he was speaking and and we learned that he rode that course in 446 with. Two flat tires, which, well, I mean, it's insane. I, right? I, uh, I like to fashion myself a pretty solid cyclist, right? So, <laughs> I'm six oh four up there, and I thought I rode that pretty damn well and pretty hard, probably a little too hard as it showed up. But uh, it's one of those things where I keep thinking, all right. So, say he's four. 40 435 realistically mm-hmm. without the flats i'm thinking to myself where on earth 
with especially because some of those there's so many descents that are fast. You know, it's not right. that that's not necessarily where the time's coming from. I'm like, where does that kind of hour and a half come from? But I don't know. It was just blew my doors away. That's pretty impressive. I think Starkey wrote it in that fast too, pretty much. But those are impressive times on that course. I gotta say, and. Yeah, he 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 won the day though, like without question, because he had one of the slower male bike splits. Um, who, who did? Uh, Munoz did. And oh, did he? Guys, yeah, there's a lot of guys in the 430s. Yeah, he he ended up running. Uh, he, he won it on the on the marathon. He ran a 2:46 marathon. Oh, you're right. Which, okay, my bad. Well, even there, that's like yeah, which was ripping that course was, up. Yeah, which was almost 15 minutes faster than any of the other professionals that were even within like sight distance mm. uh, yeah so i think yeah i just i, I guess what before so in real i guess to back to your course the the race that you're racing the hardest race you're going to do is the one you're training for to me that makes so much sense and i think there's one other thing that we look at when you know the whole rate the whole week leading up everybody's obviously checking the weather that's always a major concern and it's always about the is it going to rain and how cold is it going to be you know, in my saran wrap shoes. And <laughs> so it was always about that, but I, it's so rare for anybody ever to mention wind. And to me, that's always the biggest element. <laughs> it just mm-hmm. seems like it is. And it showed up in the morning. We walked down there, and I'm like, oh, boy. I was looking at those flags. It was, you know, 6 in the morning, and they were waving. And I I was thinking, boy, that's going to be a, a rough day. Obviously, the water looked a little rough, and I, I didn't know what I was about to get into, but... As it turned out, I think it turned into almost a perfect day after that, uh, condition-wise. Yeah. I mean, like you said, it's you know, it's it's our, you know, habit to exaggerate and always say it was this and that. And I immediately got off the bike, and my first thought was, "Boy, it was windy out there," but it wasn't. It, it didn't. It was windy, but it was definitely not you know, a debilitating wind by any stretch of the imagination. I thought it was probably perfect conditions for cycling, so that may explain some of these good times. Yeah, not, it was not what it was definitely not what you expected uh from being on shore or on the or on Monona Terrace or probably in the swim. You probably anticipated lots of wind. Yeah. On the bike course based on what we were getting right there at the swim start. I think it actually, you know, usually um you know, gets a lot. Get the wind gets stronger as a course as a, as the day goes on. But I found it was very odd that the the wind actually died down considerably um, after the swim because I remember thinking, oh man, this is going to be this is going to be a really tough day yeah. uh, with the wind. But there were a lot of other athletes also said that that the wind was you know it wasn't nearly as much as you as you thought. Um, but and can I mention though that. No, the only, <laughs> the only we, we you know we said it many many times, but it's always that that headwind coming in on that stick, that is the the great equalizer sort of to mm-hmm. the last fifteen miles or something like that. And I know we mentioned to not underestimate the hills coming back in, but there's per, one particular hill on Waylon, I think Waylon Road or whatever that. I was reminded in a hurry that it might have been the tougher, one of the toughest climbs of the day. It's a pretty steep, it's steeper than you think. You're going out and you kind of, it's a long, faster descent on the way out and you're feeling good and everything like that. But when you come back in, I think it's with about seven miles left in the ride. Mm -hmm. And I looked down and my my speedometer was like really falling in a hurry. And people were really struggling. So I, I think that actually is... I don't know. It felt like one of the steeper hills. It probably isn't, but certainly in relativity, it is. Well, I mean, they the the longer you go, the steeper and longer and and um, more you know, and the incline feels like it increases. Obviously, the second time you do it, just because your your body's fatigued and it, it's you know most things. Even if you can see raw numbers, it's even if you're pushing the same watts or the same heart rate, the effort's going to feel you know not significantly, but it's going to feel higher yeah. than it is the definitely place, notice that on the second loop that's that, just that that's just hill. how it goes um that's just the nature of the race and you know preparing to you know to hopefully be be stronger as things get longer um and so i think that yeah i mean it was definitely a tough course and that but having said that i think once athletes brought it in you know obviously being a long hard day i mean it's i think it's listen the course is anywhere from 4500 to 5000 feet it's it's a 
you know everybody's Garmin reads different. It's 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 a hilly ride, and it was a long day uh, after after what I would say was a a much more difficult swim. The run I thought I think the run course in Madison is deceptively hard, uh, and I think it's that way. I wouldn't. It's not a Chattanooga, right? Um, but it's definitely not a Louisville. <laughs> you know, but I think once I think a couple things affect the run at Madison differently. And again, it's about courses as a whole and how they are stacked against. And that's why I think this course, while it may not get some of the fanfare as, as other courses in terms of difficulty, I think um, as as individual aspects and disciplines of the races are, are, are you know, what they're determined on as a whole. I think Wisconsin is one of the more difficult races uh, when you look at how things line up from start to finish. Uh, yeah, courses like Chattanooga have tough, you know, tough run courses, you know, very tough run courses. And, you know, last year has been fairly hot. You know, courses like Louisville where this, you know, but both Louisville and Chattanooga have really, really easy swims compared to a lot of other races. The bike course at Louisville is, you know, it's, it's rollers, but, you know, you can still maintain a lot of that speed and then you get to the run and it's, it's flat. You know, then you got races like, you know, like Placid where it's, it's much more similar in my opinion to Wisconsin or a race like Tremblant it's also those three are really kind of the same category and it's all because how things stack and line up you know and and we always talk about how training for for long course racing whether it's 70.3 or fulls or whatever it is it's about energy expenditure and how you can manage that and prepare your body to become really really durable on these race days and that it's never about how fast you go it's about how little you slow down and a course like this that starts with no break there is no break you know, a lot of these, because you start off with a very long open water swim. Uh, yes, it's got a wetsuit, but as you guys saw on, on Sunday, but a, a very a fair to not, a fair to just tough swim. You're on it from out of the gate. And I think all, we oftentimes underestimate the impact of being, and again, this is why I harp on so much, is like the amount of energy and mental, uh, even mental expenditure, not just the physical part, from a tough swim like that. And then starting the day to, you know, you, now you've got a really difficult bike ride, it takes its toll on people. And so from start, from start to finish, once you've gone through a tough swim, or you've, and then you've gone through, and again, like we talked about the bike course being one where you have to be like really, really engaged, right? Because you're making a ton of decisions. The Wisconsin swim is one where like you can't take any breaks. Yeah, it's got long straightaways and it's not super technical, but there's also, there's that, that in my opinion makes it more difficult, Right, like it's not it's not two loops where you're making turns every 400 meters and you you're adjusting. It's like you got to swim as close to straight as possible for a mile, right? And then you finally make a turn and come back and do another mile. And so you, I think you actually have to stay more engaged because you can veer off course. And so you do that. Check. You go to the bike course. Tough bike course. Um, always a always a tough fair course. Bumpy roads. Uh, hills, turns, you're gay. Then you get to the marathon and you're like, oh my God, I've been not only just physically expending my energy the way that I think it should, but I've also mentally like been thinking 24 seven, right? Like I, mm, I, I've, like, yeah. I've been on it and on it on all day. And now I have to think my way through this marathon, not in like a strategic logistic way necessarily, but a, I've got to make good decisions and i've got to will myself to be like have, basically it's like you know i haven't you got to have your wits about you you know to, to to motivate yourself and make good decisions and, and be driven from within and the the course itself is it's got it's got flats it's got rollers and it's got a few pinchers at like some of the more difficult places on course to where if you line them all up and put them in a row it's a tough run and i think i think that that also was um you know, caught a few people off guard as well. Mm. You make a really good point there. I, there, you, it's hard to think about turns as making a course tougher, but I mean, it's it just it's logical. I mean, obviously, I never really think about it, but there are a lot of those. And we talk about the one into the Camp Randall, and you go around and run around the foot, you're turning four or five times, and coming back up a steep little, you know, coming out of the football field. There's a steep ramp, and. Uh, and then you got to kind of turn and turn and turn, and then you're just turning again. And I like it. It's just that it does make it tough to find 
a groove. It's almost like swimming in a pool where you got to kind of get back into your stroke again. You know, it's your turn mm-hmm. in the corner and you got to find that. If you do find that run stride, and I, I would I would be interested to see, you know, like I think probably a lot of people do find a nice stride when they run along the lake in that path, for example. It's a little bit of a longer stretch, and especially on the first loop. And there there are some challenges out there it didn't feel like uh, you know that hilly section in the middle of course is is a tough one and uh um and then state street gives you that energy but you are you're going up and you're doing turnarounds and all this kind of stuff all over the place which i love about it's the same thing i love about the course it's just it's it does engage you and Mm -hmm. it doesn't let you i was uh actually texting with a buddy of mine who's done many races i respect his opinion and stuff like that we were talking about it and i was like man, I just got off that bike again, and, uh, you know, I just uh, didn't have that run. And he was saying, well, maybe, because I love hills, right? You know, I, I feel comfortable climbing hills on the bike. and But maybe it does take more out of maybe I'm Maybe I'm not as an under control, and, you know, maybe that's going back to power meter discussion. But look, aside from that, he kind of mentioned, well, maybe you need a flatter bike course. And I was like, at first I thought, you know, I don't know about this, but... It makes kind of sense in a way, and then maybe with the hilly run. So maybe like a course like Chattanooga might mm-hmm. play into more speed because I like, I feel strong with on run. And I ran all the hills the other day, and I feel stronger on hills I think than most people running wise. So that can that can make sense in that way, but it's kind of illogical in a way. But also it would probably fit into me better because my swim is so inconsistent, even when I think I'm swimming well, and and that would be a good race in that regard. But anyway. Um, I think it. I think it goes to a a different level of. You know, we 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 use that phrase like you know different horses for different courses, mm-hmm. and I think that while that's very very true from a physical standpoint, you know, uh, pick a, you know if you're a great swimmer, pick a swim like Madison where it's difficult, you know, or Texas where it's difficult, you know, if you're a, if you're a less you know not that not that good of a swimmer, but you're a great runner, obviously Chattanooga, but. I think sometimes what we don't talk about is like mentally what kind of athlete are you? Can you hold it together for a long period of time? Are you are you mentally and emotionally engaged and resilient enough? That was that was the last thing that um and I caught some of them and I didn't catch them all uh before race day as my little pre morning text. Um and that was that was the ultimate sentiment I was trying to express to everyone was was it was about the day was going to be about resiliency, and I texted you know I said as everyone whether they got them or not on race day it was it was basically just be as resilient as possible. Uh, it was I just said swim resilient focus, bike resilient patience, run resilient forward progress, and on a course like Wisconsin where you don't get breaks. I think again, because if you're if you're thinking about like you know, at the pointy end of the of the age groups, or even just where you're going to place overall, like if you're a durable athlete who is who can keep it together and keep your wits about you and just I hate to use the word grind, but like just grind it out all day, that's your course, right? Because there is no mental break. Whereas you know people who might be really 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 fit, but tend to you know let's so take like you know Des Linden winning the Boston Marathon last year. Right, so she she won it in horrid, awful conditions, and beat runners that were more than likely, you know, if you had gone to like 60s and sunny with no wind, probably, you know, I think she would admit this probably would have beat her. But she talked about how training up in Michigan and, um, you know, oh, I think it was Deslin, but yeah, um, she talked about training in Michigan in those conditions. Like this was like her, this was her venue. She weathered, tough, grinded out. This this is a huge advantage for me. And so if you, I think if you look at that, like I was kind of joking with one of our other athletes who got second in his age group, and the guy ahead of him was from Alaska. And I was like, no wonder he did so good today. <laughs> like the dude's like, you know, dude's weathered and experienced like no one. Like this to him seemed like a nice spring warm day. He probably got overheated. Yeah. but. But so I think that like when you look at that races that demand so much of you, they, they demand every bit of you from the time you get in the water. Chattanooga, Louisville, I mean, yeah, is the swim demanding? Sure. But the amount of engagement and, and 
physical energy you expend versus like when you have to to weigh the two against each other, it's a big difference. You know. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think that that if you're looking for races like that and you find yourself you know, on the cusp of trying to get on the podium or break into the top 20 or, or race, you know, just place really well overall or, or even be on the podium, you have to look to races that might fit your mental strengths mm -hmm. in terms of this is a good race for me because I can, I will be there at the end because I just won't go away. And I think that's something that as courses go, we always look at elevation profiles and and heat and temperature i think sometimes we we tend to forget the the demand the psychological demands that different uh different races play on you man that is a solid really solid point i think oh thanks yeah man i was as you were saying that i was kind of envisioning that swim and thinking that it, it does it's sort of like i think people just i don't know i want to say take it for granted but it when you're saying that i I was thinking back to when I swam Louisville and how you get out to the end of the channel and then you have that 400 or 500 yards or whatever into the channel upstream a little bit. That's a little bit what Wisconsin felt like the whole time. It was kind of like fighting and battling and sort of trying to, like you're saying, it just be engaged the entire swim. It wasn't that you know casual stroke the whole way down without really much contact. There was a lot of contact for me, of course. And I think I underestimate what that takes out of me, too. And you know, I think, to your point, I would consider myself, quote unquote, a little bit of a grinder. And I can fight through, and I like that bike course, and I probably hit a little too hard or whatever, and then just fight through the run. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's that swim, I think, is uh, underestimated on what it can take out of you. And people look genuinely beat up when they got out mm. they looked genuinely beat up like their face was like god thank god i made it out of that mm -hmm. like and these are like so, these are like even people on the front end they look much more exhausted um right and, so you're saying they're going they know what they're shooting for and we're probably all putting a little more effort out than we might normally want to well, yeah, and that's just to hold I mean, the same similar time or whatever. That's, that's exactly right. So you're pushing higher effort to go slower for longer, because the the current there was a little bit of a like undercurrent. The wind there was windier. I know I talked to multiple athletes that I coach and don't coach, or talked about how hard it was to sight. You had to sight multiple times, and again, those are also things that I think a lot of athletes don't take into account. Is that Sighting a ton puts a lot of strain on your core and on your back and on your neck. And the, so you have to do it a whole lot and you don't do it a whole lot and you're not prepared to do it. That again is another, it's another like re removal of the Jenga, you know, the Jenga yeah, piece. And, and I'm practicing that alligator eye sight all, you know, summer and that thing was worthless, you know. Right, right. You, you had to like, <laughs> you know, I was joking about one of the athletes at August camp when they sighted it looked like you. You know, it looked like more like when you hook like a, a largemouth bass. You know, it's like you could see like their whole like chest and trachea when they sighted. And but that's kind of what you had to do on Sunday, right? Is is mm -hmm. is to get up that high, and then you'd do it multiple times because you'd go to sight and you would you know you'd look straight into some chop or you'd look into or you'd take in a mouthful of water. And so again, like when you talk about how long the day is and you don't go in prepared and and you may have not taken the swim as seriously as you thought, and then you end up being in the water 10 minutes longer to go slower and expend more energy than you thought you know if, you, if you're looking at you know the if you're looking at racing long courses like a you know a, the big jenga building and or the jenga black whatever they whatever it's called and every t every you know every so often when you take some energy out and you take some bites out you know or you go over pinchers on the bike course or whatever you take a piece out and then the the obviously the name of the game is to get to like mile 20 and it still be standing on the run without just crumbling, you know, and having to walk the rest of the way. And it might not be super sturdy, but it's still standing. And so when you anticipate starting the bike with a little more structure, a little more um, depth and density to your to your jingle block, and you've already taken out like five or six pieces out of the swim, that affects your whole day. And and so again, I think that again, if you're not taking the swim seriously, you're doing yourself a disservice because it, it it's not it doesn't affect just your swim; it affects your whole day. And so again, you know, when you look at courses, look at courses that fit you, the athlete. 
not just the physical version, not just the one that's based on fitness and preference and oh, I can't do well in the heat, I just can't do it, and or I don't do well on the cold, that's not for me. You know, it's like we look at all these little things that basically roll ourselves into giving ourselves the most convenient circumstance possible. But again, when you're when push comes to shove, it's like you know, do you like to be in error for a long time or do you not? Do you find yourself needing to sit up or not sitting up? Like, do you struggle with the swim? Do you not struggle with the swim? Are you a great runner? Are you not, you know, so, you know, are you a person who loves to grind it out, who will always be there at the end, whether you like it or not? Just kind of that annoying mosquito that never goes away or that gnat that's like, God, that person's still there. There they go. Mm-hmm. You know, because cause you might have the fitness, but there are so many equalizers. And I think that's that's what I love so much about triathlon and that's why i love long distance racing is that the longer the day goes the more even things can become you you know short course sprint you know sprint distance olympic distance even 70.3s to an extent depending on the course and and the fitness level and the and the degree of competition you're going against it's like it's only so long you know You, you can make a mistake or two but overall fitness and speed generally trumps great decision making and great patience and great execution but when you make that jump to long distance racing, when the races are so long, I mean, I saw, I saw an athlete in an older women's division overcome an hour on the run to win their age group. Wow. Like that is that. That's why I think it's such a fascinating distance. In that, fitness is one thing, but your expre- your ability to express that fitness via, you know, the the physical things you're able to do. The emotional and mental stability and thought process and sticking to your plan and then the nutrition and the fueling. Like, there are so many equalizers that if you race the same course, you know, it's like when they give out odds in the NBA championship, you know, for like, or whatever, for like, you know, best four out of seven, you know, they're like, that's why it's not one and done, you know, because of four out of seven, like, generally the best team is going to win. But if you had one game, anything can happen. Mm hmm. Anything can happen. We see upsets all the time in every major sport. You know, like if Tennessee actually beats Chattanooga, that'll be an upset. Uh, but, <laughs> Are you going to that? Is that in Chattanooga? Uh, 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 yeah, no, it's it's in Knoxville. Oh. <laughs> um, it's like they have three home games. They're probably going to lose all three. But anyway, but so anything can happen on one day. And so I think that that's, again, that's what makes long course racing so fascinating and so puzzling. But we're also drawn to it because there's so many things that can go wrong and things that can go right, and you just never know. And obviously, you got to prepare yourself. But um, you know, training your athletes to—I was thinking about this. I uh, had other athletes like ask me some questions on race day, and other coaches, and um, I was like, you know, I said I don't, I don't ask a lot of out of my athletes on each day, but I do ask. A little bit of something from them every day. I just I ask, every day I ask, I ask them to do something every single day. Whether in because mo- most of them they don't get a day off, but I ask a little bit of something every day. I don't ask for these huge days, and I think that I think that hopefully that sets them up for success in a lot of ways, you know, via consistency and execution, and that's just generally how you should do things. But I think that being able to to focus on always knowing that something's going to be required of you and you don't get a break nor do you have to do something incredibly special in this moment you just have to keep plugging away and i think that translates not just physically and how they adapt and how they're prepared but i think from a physical standpoint i think in a way it translates to their preparedness on race day to know that all day long they're going to have to ask themselves and they're going to give a little bit back they're never going to give a ton all at once but they just got to give a little bit each time, each minute, each hour, each discipline, each section, each hill, each flat, each mile of the run. They just got to give a little bit. And then if they can do that and they can keep giving instead of feeling like the course and the conditions and the environment are taking away from them, then more than likely you're going to end up having a pretty good day. Mm. Yeah, and I think we talked about this a little bit. I think it was at the awards when – because I was – you know, I noticed – it, it matters, I think, uh, if as far as taking stress away and, and relieving some of that. If you, you know, there's a lot of people that ride the course a lot in the summer up there, for example. Mm-hmm. And I, I just was thinking, man, that has to, you know, I, I like the idea of, 
and it's kind of dumb, but I sort of like not seeing the course or not riding it. Just it's sort of like a friendly surprise, like a gift unwrapping or something for me, in some regard. But I really know that I underestimate how important it is to be familiar with the with the course like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we drove it the day before, two days before, and I still had no memory of like what I was going to yeah. face on every turn. But uh, you know, that's a it's a very popular course to ride. Uh, and a lot of people, I think, that do the race ride it often, and that's yeah, I mean, they, uh, they they do. Then they do the best. I mean, I know, I know the overall, um, the overall female age group winner lives there mm-hmm. and rides it like twice a week, every weekend. Mm-hmm. You know, so like the, those kind of things, you just can't replace. You mm-hmm. know, the the familiarity with with a course like that that is so technical then it does ask so many things of you if you can make something that's daunting and challenging and engaging and and mentally and emotionally um you know exhausting to an extent if you can take those away and just make it another day in the saddle that's huge you know there is nothing that's gonna be unexpected you already know these turns like to well you know to to the extent that it all, can it also be a, a bad thing because <laughs> the uh one of our athletes glenn who ended up uh t- taking a spill on the bike uh had pre-rode the course like seven times and he anticipated so much of it that, that at one poor one place in the course they kind of i guess they had mismarked previously to where you go on a bike path, or you didn't, but you went up on a. Oh, another, I know exactly place. where that was. Yeah. Was... And so he actually went to go on where he had always been running, you know, been cycling the last six times, and they changed it, and he wasn't prepared because they changed it, and <laughs> and so he actually went down. So again, like it's a good thing, but it's also like one of those things where you got to be aware. Yeah, and I'm not take, taking away anything from that. I think that's awesome, and it's great. It's just that, like sometimes when you know a lot of people come in from way away and ride that course for the first time, I just sort of want to maybe point out that you know that is a little bit of a, I guess a little bit of a disadvantage in some regard. So don't expect miracles, and I think that's what I tend to do is like I just I know that course and I don't really know it. I mean <laughs> I've ridden it three times mm-hmm. and in six years, and I can't really remember where I rode yesterday. So it's like you know. It, uh, I could see how it would be a nice uh, thing to have in your back pocket. Is all I'm saying. Nothing wrong with with racing it a couple times, or racing it, or you know, riding it a few times. You know, mm-hmm. I think. Well, I know if we've said this before on one of the earlier podcasts. Like, I think, you know, there's like, oh, I got to go ride the course 19 times. Yeah, I think you like, just with anything in life and in training, you know, ride it a few times and figure it out and then figure out how you need to pace and how you need to train and how you need to execute and then go back and train harder you know mm-hmm. and, or, or figure things out or fine tune things or work on skills that you need right don't just you know like don't just memorize the way to get there right you know, know how it's going to go and know how you what you need to do and, and focus on that that that's it's a yeah i mean it's it's a it's definitely a good point i think and, and well and one other thing because uh when we wrote it with jessica she kept pointing out and this is something I never really thought about, but she was always pointing out sections of the course for fueling. And that, to me, is maybe another great... Because you, if you're unfamiliar with what's going on and you start reaching your back pocket, the next thing you know, you're turning this corner and going up a hill and you can't really uh, hit your nutrition as consistently as you'd like. And mm-hmm. that can be a real big challenge when you got 50-mile-an-hour downhills and hairpin turns and things like that going on. To find good spots to know when you can fuel up and be ready for the next section or whatever. Yep. So. It's a very good point. Otherwise, man, it was uh, just a fantastic weekend. I just wonderful, wonderful weekend. Um, and mom again, and like brother were up there. I yeah. really appreciate them coming out again and supporting everything and helping out. And of course, I don't know what do we have. Just I don't know. It seemed like everywhere I turned, there was a team member or somebody that has listened to the podcast shouting out and saying hello and i uh have to give a little bit of a an apology oh well i mean i'm out on on the run and and i was so great apologize are you gonna apologize to me finally for being so grumpy all weekend <laughs> yes i'm sorry <laughs> it's all good a lot of a lot of build-up stress it was almost 
that's the thing about reflecting after a race. It's sort of like when you cross that finish line. Sometimes it uh, feels amazing, and other times it's just like a tremendous burden off your back. And that's kind of how I felt a little bit. But on the run, so many people said hi and, and told me, you know, they like listening to the podcast. And it's just so awesome to hear it. And, you know, I'm out there trying to hold my, my head together, and sometimes I wasn't always, like, chatty or whatever. But uh, They don't expect that from you. I, I know. I, I just... You know how I am, though. It's like I, I want to get yeah, to know people. Yeah, I know. You're I always feel like that there's never enough time to really genuinely connect with people, and that's, uh, you know, just sort of, I guess, an, a microcosm of what I wish I had more time for, and that's just sitting around and getting to know people, and that's kind of where the text came from this morning is I really appreciate all the support, and I'm I'm proud of my finish, and it feels good, and, I, and I've recommitted to this idea that you have to do things that are hard in life because I think that's what keeps you strong and and younger and the idea of of doing like I said six years later doing a race at about the same pace and actually feeling stronger going into it is that's how I want to live you know and I I don't know if I have all the secrets and I know nobody does for how to race these damn things but uh I really want to get more focused on, you know, the coaching side of things and and helping people find, you know, those new spots in life and finding rejuvenation or whatever it may be. And and that's really was kind of my first thought after as I was driving home yesterday was that, you know, I, I feel like I've I want to keep going. I'm not going to be done racing or anything like that, but I, I just want to shift the focus a little bit into you know seeing what you know how we can touch more people or other people and help them and that's what you know obviously what you've been doing to with great success and i'm super proud of what you do and how many athletes that you've connected with and and the group and everything it's just uh dude what are you trying to get all emotional for i'm, I'm sorry man it's just uh, you, you held off you know when it mattered uh at the live podcast and I was over there breaking down like I was on some Hallmark special um, <laughs> I gotta say you're talking about seeing people on the course I do gotta get I don't know who this was but I uh, I was just I just ordered some food I was about to cram down a, a burger from Cooper's Tavern uh, in my famous not so famous um boxed lunch bus stop photo you ran uh, it back that, huh that was taken to me no I, I actually went uh, um I was giving a high five to somebody, and I, and I got listen. I, I really think this is a great idea. I know we talk about. I try to stay away from the apparel and the gear and stuff, but I really, truly think that making like a C twenty six spectator glove is a great idea. Like our <laughs> logo right on the palm, uh, you know, a tight glove. You know, so you can give solid high fives and stuff. But I just got to thinking, like I'm over there at mile one. People are just leaving transition, and they just got off the bike. And I gave this, I gave like this one dude, just like, hey, you see, twenty six, Coach Rob, we love your podcast. And this guy's gonna know who I'm talking about. He gives me this five, Give and I sandwich. swear, no, I swear, nine pounds of Vaseline and three ounces of chamois <laughs> cream went splattering all over my hand. And I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm thinking like. This dude has just got done wiping his crotch with every lubricant imaginable after riding his bike for six hours. I'm disgusting. I need to. This has got to go. So I, so I, I, re, I, I, I reached quick. I wiped it off, and I got some hand sanitizer from a couple people. And uh, I apologize to the people after that that went to get me very, very, very excited high fives, only to get the conservative fist bump. I was no, I was no longer opening up the five. I was just giving out solid fist bumps. It made for a couple awkward uh, interactions, but hey, listen, I, I got to take care of myself, okay? Um, but no, it was awesome to see everybody. I, I enjoyed meeting everyone. Uh, the live podcast was a blast. Um, love Madison. It's like it, it's such a great timing, timed weekend with fall coming and the trees and um, the farmers market and. We even had like the spectators like that were there with our team like we had a group run of like 15 of us <laughs> like going to hang like running the the campus and and hanging out and and doing some fun stuff and I just think it was uh, it was it was an overall really 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 special weekend I uh, can't wait to do it again and uh, we got Chattanooga coming up in in three weeks and then we'll be off at Louisville and um, hey. We just keep, we'll just keep plugging away. Yeah. And loving it. 
and loving it, man. Mm. All right, so as That's always, it. Tuesday cast. Oh, I'm gonna have, have the. Uh, I wanna. I've been working on getting. I have posted the podcast from with Jessica. The mm-hmm. live podcast is is up, obviously number three hundred. But I've been scrambling for what seems like three days to figure out how to get the video portion of that uploaded because we recorded it and I synced the audio. So if anybody wants to watch that, I should have that up on YouTube by the night, and I'll make sure that it's posted somewhere. But it's just kind of it. cool. Uh, it's kind of a nice way to take a look into what was going on that day, and uh, so sounds good. And uh, hey, as usual. We appreciate you listening, as always, and for supporting us the way that you do. And uh, if you want to, we'd love you if you would hop on over to iTunes, give us a review, uh, let us know what you think, uh, and if you have any questions about the other, or are just intrigued by the other things that we do and we produce and we offer, you can always go to crushingiron.com. It's got a list of uh, training, training and coaching uh, services we provide, swim analysis, our blog, camps, gear. You name it, it's on there. Check it out, crushingiron.com. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns for Mike, you can hit him up directly, crushingiron at gmail.com. Or if you have any of the like for me, you can reach me directly, c26coach at gmail.com. All right, buddy. All right, man. Talk to you uh, Thursday. Sounds good. All right, man. See you.